All right, everyone. This is master class number three. We are joined by Clay Hilly and Sarah Jacobi, um, tenor, soprano. Um, I met Clay a little over 10 years ago, and not while working, but while auditioning in New York City, we had a mutual friend, and uh, we had, uh, there's, a, there's a Staten Island ferry that we enjoyed our time on, went to Staten Island. The only free thing in New York City. <laughs> so when you're a young artist, you really find ways to, to do free stuff on the water. So naturally, La Spezia is working out pretty well, but there's plenty of water. Um, both are living in uh, Berlin and uh, doing the thing, doing the professional singing thing. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, today is primarily a talk, um, so it's, it's uh, a little bit about the business overall, how you sustain yourself, and then hopefully we'll have a decent time for some Q&A. Yeah. Um, and then we have another master class on Monday in the afternoon. It's already on the schedule. I encourage you all to, on the schedule, it's called, still called the tentative schedule, but really it's the schedule that keeps changing every day. Um, but the master class on Monday will not change, and under each master class you'll find the website of each artist. I encourage you, if you haven't yet, look at those websites or do your Google searches because um, the people that you have uh, with you here are really just fantastic, including Betty and Sarah. So I will turn it over to you all. Have fun, okay? <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you all. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about money and the industry. Um, when we were talking about things that we wished had been really communicated to us in an honest way as young artists, we felt like the talk about money was something that was sort of glossed over. And um, it's going to be a huge part of your life, a huge part of your professional decisions, your life decisions. And this talk might have some things that sound like a little depressing or scary. None of this is intended to discourage you in any way from going into this wonderful industry. But we just think that going in with all the information and like having your eyes open with real numbers and real facts is a really important way to make sure that you're starting to plan for your career now, you're making smart financial decisions, and that when you get into the business, there aren't these shocks of like, wait, no one told me this, this wasn't what I expected. Um, so we're going to be open books. Um, a big passion of mine is entrepreneurship and parallel careers within the opera industry. I have been a serial entrepreneur throughout my career. Um, I have had a fashion resale business. Um, you might all be too young to remember Shoporatic, but I was um, one of the co-owners of Shoporatic um, for about five years. I own an antique fine jewelry business, I'm a certified jeweler, um, and I have planned all of these side businesses so that they enhance and work with my performance career. Um, I noticed that in past generations, the side hustle thing was something that was kind of like a hush-hush deal. And when the pandemic happened, people started coming out of the woodwork, either being like, oh no, I don't have another means of income, or saying, hey, I've been doing this under the radar for the past 10 to 15 years while having a really great singing career. Um, I didn't feel like it was a safe time to talk about it, but now that all of y'all are scrambling, I just want to say, like, I'm a badass coder, or, you know, like, I have, like, this great job that I can do online while I'm on gigs, and we should be talking about this. So, um, yeah, that's just today, like, talking about the expenses of a career um, at different times in your like, life cycle of, of being singers, um, brainstorming different side hustle ideas, and then answering any questions that you have. Do you need to add? Oh, you're great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, so um, what you make as a singer was really never something that was like, communicated to us in the conservatory track, the young artist track. Um, both of us had parents who were like somewhat concerned about it. We always had the messaging that performing artists or artists of any kind didn't make a ton of money. But 
I never really knew like what does that mean? Like what is a lot of money? What is not a lot of money? I think as a college student, even as a young person in my 20s, I don't know that I really understood like how much money do you need to live comfortably? And I definitely didn't know how much money do you need to live comfortably while also financing your career. And I think that that is a huge part of the picture. Um, I think there's sort of this Hollywood um, myth about success as an artist and the story is like, you temp, you wait tables, and then you get discovered, and then your career happens, and then you don't have to do those things anymore. But <laughs> being an opera singer is like a career that you are always financing. So once you make it, you're still financing your career, and it costs a ton of money. So making it, being successful, having a full schedule, truly just means that your expenses are going to go up. You're just going to be spending them on different things. Um, so that was something that was really something that, like, once it started happening, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, it helps when you bring your taxes. You have a lot of write-offs, but when you do your taxes and you look at how much money you've poured into your career, not just building it up or promoting it, but just like living your life as a singer, paying to get to your gigs preparing your gigs, um, your website, your photos, your social media, uh, if you have an agent, your agent commissions, like just those costs of doing business um, really only get bigger as your career grows. So being able to finance those things um, is, is really, really important. And knowing what your base costs are for just living your life Supporting the things that you want to have, and then also financing your actual career. So, um, kind of the secret that's been behind the scenes is that most artists have another source of income, whether it's a supportive spouse who um, works a more steady, salary maybe job, um, or they have or they have a side hustle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at this point, do you have any questions that will kind of guide like where we, where we go so I'm not just talking at you? I think we can be talking at you, but yes? Um, how much, uh, how much is what percentage of what you're making is from being in the opera versus from all the Yeah, so it can change season to season. Um, and, and that's the other thing about like being a freelancer is that in, or even fast each season is very different. So okay, so one thing to keep in mind is that okay, so play like out of what you make singing, you say thirty percent you take home. Yeah. Yeah. So. As taxes, they're being withheld. Your agent commission, your cost of living away from home. You. If, if you're lucky, you're taking home about 30% of your actual, of your actual like, number that appeared on your contract. Yeah. And if you're unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> 15, 10, 5. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to answering your question in full. But going back to that 30%, um, so a lot of that depends on where you're working. Um, so if you're in like a very expensive city, if that gig, um, like, the Met sounds great, but New York is very expensive. Like, you know, Rome is great, but Rome is very expensive. So, so what we've noticed with play is like, as the profile of the gigs increases, the money on the check increases, but the expenses that go along with it also increase. So it sort of balances out. So that 30%, you might actually end up making more, like you might end up netting more that season, but the percentage of like what the what the gross um, income is and like what you're taking home depends on, on where you're working. Or like yeah. But your question your yeah, question is yeah. more like, like what percentage like, of No, you weren't asking about percentage, you were asking yeah. raw numbers. No, you, you, were, you were asking like like of our whole income, how much is singing and how much is other things. Oh, okay. how much is other things? Yes. Oh, okay. So um, I would say for me, like 75% of my income is other things. 
Um, but like our, but our household, I would say like most of our household income just comes from the city. Yeah. Um, like personally for me, I make more money doing other things. Clay makes all of his income singing and no he, other yeah, and, <laughs> and most of our household income is from Clay's singing career. Um, during the pandemic, all of our household income was made through my business. So when the pandemic happened. I had a full schedule, I had a summer full schedule, everything was whew. and then luckily I had this jewelry business that supported us 100%. So it's like at different times in your life, different um, different things like come through. But I noticed that having having this other business, having this other source of income, when I'm really hustling that and when I'm making lots of money in that way, my singing career gets better. I get more gig, I'm putting myself out there more because I can afford to do so. So when I'm in a position where I'm focusing on like, it's only singing, it's only singing, it's only singing, the stress of like the financial situation of like, okay, I have this gig coming up and I won't be paid for this gig until after I sing the gig. But up until that point, I'm putting out money, preparing the role, coaching with different coaches, uh, traveling to auditions, like, you know, really like, uh, um, like networking and like going out and like talking myself up to people. If I'm focused on money and have that fear around finances, I kind of get into a place where like, I'm showing up smaller. I'm showing up with this like, this protective sense of like, okay, well, I won't see the money from this gig for another two months. But that's the time when you have the most momentum to like get other gigs on the books, when you're preparing for things, and you can take that to coaches, you can go to another city and coach that with someone who's really connected and might talk you up to other people. Like, that's the time when you really need cash. So I think that it's like, a large percentage of what I make in jewelry is then funneled back into opera and they feed each other in, in, in a really symbiotic way. So yeah. Um, okay, anything to add? I'm just mesmerized by the trouble. Is it distracting? <laughs> Thing to really look at is like if you're being paid oh, 500 per performance, um, how what can you get from that experience? Hopefully, your housing will be paid for, but when you look at the numbers and kind of crunch how much am I being, how much am I using to prepare for this contract? What will I net afterwards? I think a big thing in the kind of um, experience building stage of your career is to try and get as much um, content from these gigs as possible. Um, focusing on goals that you can really use going forward, getting as much video as possible. And I think a big part of making the the gigs in which you might not take any money home at the end of the contract is to um, really make a list of what what non-monetary things are you getting from this contract. I notice a lot of young artists um, wanting to fill their calendars as much as possible, but I think if you break down the numbers and look at everything like a business expense, like you're running a company, this is the money that I'm going to be paying to live, to prepare, this is the money that I'm going to be taking home. What are the non-monetary things that I can get from this experience? So as much video content as possible, um, rehearsals, like film every day, talk to the company about clips, or don't talk to the company about clips, just like secretly record everything you do and don't ask them about it. And then if they get mad, you just say, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> um, and, and then also, I think that build up to the opportunity, I think a huge thing 
is um, telling as many people as possible and singing that role for as many people as you can to get as many opportunities and networking kind of things as you can as your um, as you hear it up for it. So these are also things that cost money. So I think what I'm saying with all of this is like up to a certain point you might not really be making enough for working at opera to make financial sense. Like when you truly look at the numbers, like what am I paying to prepare this role? What am I taking home after all of those expenses? It's absolutely normal for that number to be like $300 when all is said and done. Even if the fee looks good, like it's totally normal to not, to not net that much money. And I think at this stage it's really important to be really Knowing the story behind what they're buying, 
that. Like, oh, I bought this ring, and it comes from an opera singer. And um, that kind of like duality of the career um, is super, super helpful. There, are, I also have access to a demographic of people who I might not meet in real life. Professionals working in big cities, spending thousands of dollars on fine jewelry. Like, those are the people who go to the opera. Those are the people who give money to the opera. So I'm like hitting um, that prime demographic. So I will just be really honest. Like I have to switch my focus. I'm going to start showing you what that looks like. And I think it works out really, really nicely. Also for the algorithm, they love the, uh, the shift in content. So if I'm constantly showing pictures of jewelry, and then I shift to you know, showing video or showing pictures or showing travel, that like usually does really good things for my reach. So that's great. Um, I think teaching, so many people are teaching online. And if you are able to own your own business and run your own studio, I think being really honest with your students about you know what is happening in your life and your career and the fact that you need to rearrange the schedule. Um, I think that's exciting for your students to to see you model those things for them and to show them what what can be and how to um, how to balance it both. So I think honesty and, and transparency is really the best policy. It's much more difficult if you're working for someone else. Um, but that's why I think owning your own business or really focusing, having like the big picture in mind, the end goal of like, I want my, my parallel hustle to be something that I can see myself doing on the road or I can see myself doing um, when I am traveling. Um, Church jobs are wonderful, but they make it really difficult to be able to just pick up and go. So it's actually not something that I would recommend if your end goal, your big picture, is like just being able to pick up for an audition. Or if you do find a church job that you really, really love, talk to them in advance and see if you can line up like a set of subs who are like ready and willing and able to just jump in. Maybe have an agreement with them where you can send them the music every week so that, um, you know, and talk in advance with them to be like, this is where I see my schedule going. Um, I think I might be away on these dates after every rehearsal. Here's the music that we worked on, like, so there are no surprises. Um, and just have your list of colleagues lined up and be like, all right, like, we'll cover for each other. <laughs> see if you can share. But I, I know that church gigs can make it really, really difficult to just have the freedom to pick up for an audition and leave for a two or three month gig. So, um, yeah, I sort of have seen that not go the way, the way people have planned. Um, and, and the balance is difficult too. Like I've been at different places with the business um, in like complete transparency. When the opera world started to come back, I had just been like going hard with the jewelry business. And I was really, really successful at it. It was just going so well. And I was like, oh my God, like I've just never made this much money in my life. Like this is incredible. And then opera started to pick up again. And I realized that I was working 14 hour days. And because my business was online, I was constantly in this place where I was like always available, always on Instagram, always like answering messages and talking to people and just like going so hard in that area that I felt like I had no more creative space to think about singing. I was still like working in repertoire and like working with my teacher and all of that, but it was like I didn't have the creative like kind of like yeah, like in my mind was, my mind was never free. It was like, I was always dreaming about like, oh my gosh, what if UPS like this place this package? Or like, okay, tomorrow I have to wake up and like photograph like 15 items and then I have to like, you know, write the listings. And I was just, I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't dream about opera. I was just so tired and like so 
depleted and Clay and I talked about it and he was like, you have, you have to step back. Like, if, you know, like there really are only so many hours in the day and you need time as an artist to like feel, to like have those creative moments where you're not thinking about anything, where you can just like brainstorm and be like, you know what, I think I'm going to reach out to this coach or like, you know what colleague I haven't reached out to in a while, like I'm going to set up a coffee date and like talk about like what connections we can work on together. And I felt like I had no, um, no creative mind space for that. So I did have to step back and moving to Europe really helped with that because the time difference, most of my jewelry clients are in New York um, or, or LA, but they're in the States. And so we had like a six to nine hour time difference and I had the whole day in Europe no one was awake. <laughs> and that's when I realized like this is the balance that I need. So I found a healthier balance and, um, and the jewelry business is not as successful, but the balance that I find in my artistic and business life is a lot more So sometimes you do need to just like take stock and be like, I cannot do it all. What is my heart telling me? What do I need to do to like feed both of feed both of my loves and like and find that find that balance? So yeah, any any questions now? <laughs> All right. Um, yes. How long for? What made you want to go into jewelry? Was that like a part of your from the beginning? Yes. Okay. So I love talking about this. Well, first of all, I've always, I've always loved fashion. I've always loved jewelry, and like especially antiques and vintage in both, in both elements. And jewelry was always like something that I loved, like a dirty little secret. Like it was something I loved that I knew I couldn't afford, and like felt that it was maybe something that like wasn't for me as an artist, but I loved it. So I remember in undergrad, I came upon this forum for antique jewelry lovers. Um, and it was like this like, janky, like old school forum, like probably one of the first things, like by the time I found it, it had probably been around for like 20 years. Like it was like really low tech. All of these jewelry people with like, you know, code usernames, like sharing their jewelry, talking about their jewelry, um, amazing pieces, like like 10 carat antique diamond rings, like just like incredible things. And I was like, this is so cool. I'll never be the kind of person who can afford this. I'm an opera student, but like, this is something I love looking at. So like in my spare time, I would just be like reading these forums and like learning about things, learning about antiques, learning about like buying diamonds, what are collectors really into? What are the different trends within the antique jewelry world and like the modern jewelry world? So then I was like, I know a lot about this. And I was still like, maybe the end of undergrad. Um, I was like, I know a lot about this, but like I still can't afford it, but I can act like someone who can afford it. So I would get dressed up like from time to time and like go to really nice antique jewelry stores and just start talking to them and like asking really intelligent questions and um, as soon as the jewelers would like realize that I knew about antiques they would start bringing out like the really good stuff. Not, probably not because they thought I could buy but because they saw that I loved it and that like they had someone they could talk to about it. So I started learning a lot just by talking to jewelers and like asking questions, they would bring out an interesting piece and then I would go home and like research it and you know so, and then I started doing it on gigs, and then it was like the whole story of like, I'm an opera singer, I'm singing here, and I would just, I would just talk to people and just like look at things. It was just something I did for fun. Um, in the meantime, I got really big in the, the clothing resale um, business. So I had an eBay site, um, or eBay shop, and I really loved that. A, a lot of like designer clothing, some vintage, and then I started Shop Rabbit, which for those of you who don't know, um, it started out um, as the Opera Diva Dress Collection. It was um, a Facebook group for singers to like buy, sell, trade, performance gowns. 
And then I joined the business with Suzanne Bennett, who had created the site, and we decided that we were going to turn it into a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. So we built a website, um, and for a number of years, it was like really successful. It was like the thing in Opera. Um, and we each had our own stores within the site. So we were managing the community and then each having our own shops. So I specialized in vintage. Um, I loved. So I became really good at like the photography and the marketing and the um, and the branding and the understanding what it takes to grow a, a client base and grow a community and, and market all of those things. And when Shoparata kind of came to a close, um, I thought, okay, I think I'm finally ready to transition this and sell what I really want to be selling, which is my jewelry. So I had some savings. I decided I was going to buy like 10 pieces um, and I bought 10 pieces. I had been in that world long enough to know like what market value was and know that as I was seeing things, what I could resell them for. So I bought 10 to 13 pieces and I said, like, if I can sell these, I will reinvest and grow business. So, they sold, I converted my Instagram over to, um, to a business, I built a Shopify site, and um, and yeah, I started growing that, it started going really well, and when the pandemic hit, that's when I was like, okay, it, it is, you know, it is time to really, um, you know, have this thing cover, you know, cover our life, and I um, grew my Instagram following from, um, 3,000 to 10,000 followers and um, just really like poured myself into growing that business and during that time I also um, went to gemology school online so I got certified as a GIA jeweler and um, that was like my pandemic project. So yeah, so that's that's how that all <laughs> came up. But it was something I always loved so I think that's the thing that like it was something that I saw being in alignment with a career as a singer. Um, I can wear beautiful things from my shop when I perform. I can blend things to colleagues. I can, um, you know, talk about jewelry with donors. And that knowledge, like, really goes hand in hand with, like, the image of an opera singer that people want to see, even though it's not really the image of the life we lead. But, but I felt like those two things married really nicely. Um, so that it wasn't, like, two separate lives, it was like two sides of, of the same person. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. It seems like jewelry runs in line with what uh, I call evergreen material. Yes. Stuff that never goes away. So yes. fashion, jewelry, traveling, uh, working out, athletics, yes. those kinds of things. There's always going to be articles about that. There's always going to be Instagram or some kind of social media around that. Yes. So, the, so you would agree that that seems like that jewelry fits right into those evergreen models. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And even when I'm in those, like, you know, I don't know. I was talking to someone where we're like, it's kind of like a like a relay. Like sometimes I'll hand off different elements of my career. Like sometimes you know I'll hand off the jewelry or hand off the opera, but my messaging never has to change, which is really nice in terms of a branding thing. That like. If I'm focusing more on opera or if I'm focusing more on jewelry, my social media can really stay the same. My, my photos, my, my personal brand still gets to be the same thing of like glamour, opera, travel, history, like just walking around this building and like talking about this experience. It's evergreen content that's interesting to the opera uh, audience and to the jewelry audience and to the people who like just kind of stumbled upon my social media. They don't maybe have an interest in either of those things, but it's something different and exciting and glamorous. They're like, oh, like this looks cool. Maybe they like become interested in opera or become interested in jewelry. So I think, yeah, like working out, traveling, um, cooking, mm -hmm. a life on the road kind of content is fascinating to people. I think that that is like always... Um, cats. Cats. Dogs. Oh my gosh, if you, have a, if you have a cute animal, 
that is like, you know. So, so stuff like that, that like, actually, side note, there is, um, I don't know, maybe you know about this, but there is a housing website, I have to look into it, but basically you can live places for free in exchange for taking care of people's animals. And I just think that sounds like the best like opera life hack ever because we can't have animals, we travel too much, but like how much fun would that be? Like dogs probably, depending on the gig, might be a little too much work, but like, I don't know, like a cat, a chinchilla, like fish. a fish, <laughs> like that would be so much fun. Um, so that kind of like, if you can, if you can create some kind of business that really enhances and and goes with the opera lifestyle. Like that's something to really like start building now. Like start cultivating that audience and that um, that image. So yeah, great question. Yes, just a really question. But this is really exciting to hear because, like, for my whole life, I spent like the past ten years like analyzing social media, algorithms, mm -hmm. trends, how to build accounts in different. Medium, so like whether it be art, so like I do freelance art, I used to do freelance art, or like things like that, and then I would integrate singing so I could build an online career. And I always like when I would talk to other people, I knew who wanted to go to vocal, that was never something that other people were doing, so I didn't know if it was really like the thing to yeah. like have all these other things. Like recently, I've been getting into making jewelry, it was like gonna carry the account for that, so I could have something on the side that was fun, that was creative, but didn't take up all my time. Yes. So I could focus on like figuring out how to get into the industry with singing, how to build a career online in terms of covers and things. And I didn't realize that that was actually something that was like, yeah, you should be doing. Absolutely. And just the skill that you have of building those accounts, that's a great business. Like, that's something that people will pay for, especially like, people like our age and older, <laughs> like millennial Gen X, like, you know, they don't have, we didn't grow up in like that um, world. So, so things that to you like might feel more intuitive or like, oh, everyone knows this, like everyone does not know this. You have skills that like the older generation of singers really need and they're not gonna learn how to do it. They're gonna hire someone to do it. So, so that's a great business. And all of those, like there's nothing, if you, if it feeds your soul and if you can find time for it, there's a reason that all of those things, the, the covers, the building an online career, making jewelry and helping other artists build their online following, you can do all of those things while having your musical career. So like, that's the kind of thing that like really wasn't talked about, but it's so important, it's so vital, and like it just makes it makes this lifestyle so much more comfortable. I think, um, yeah, like it probably won't have a lot to say about this, but just like the the uncomfortability of a life in opera. Um, any way that you can find to create some level of normalcy and comfort in your life as you're singing, that's going to be so important to your longevity as a singer. And money is the way to do that. Like it, it's the way. Like comfort costs money, and it's not a bad thing. Um, being a starving artist like isn't going to serve you as an artist. Like suffering for your art, like Zidane sounds great, like you know in Tosca, but like it also didn't work out too well for her. Like you know, it's like it, 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 we're we're not suffering for your art makes you a nervous artist, it makes you a, a, a protected artist. Um, not suffering and living a comfortable life is the way to be able to take risks in your art and like really get out there and and feel safer doing those things. So I think that's like finding ways to create that comfort in your life with other streams of income is vital to having a great career. Yeah. Should we talk about the costs of mm. the costs of, of opera life? I guess we've alluded to it and like yeah. you said, yeah, it's uh, it does go up 
uh, proportionally to like, you know, okay, what, what cities you're going to be in and uh, to really have, I mean, there's tons of detail to talk about. I don't actually even know where to, where to begin on it. Um, but I would say, like, from my perspective, I was never greatly entrepreneurial, but I still had, first still had bills to pay and I have, I have a held in dramatic voice, okay, so I'm 41. But until we moved into a camper together in 2017, so whatever was that, about six years ago, I was living with my folks still. So as recently as 2016, 27, I guess what is it, 2017, uh, my, my address was like with my folks. I have three younger siblings, none of whom do music, and I'll have very comfortable money making lives. And uh, here I am, the oldest brother, you know, I haven't moved back in. I've been doing, I went to University of Georgia for a music education degree. Then I went to, moved to Atlanta for a master's. Um, graduated in 07 with a master's in performing. Had a year off after that. Went to the Manhattan School of Music for one year for a one year postgrad diploma. And then went straight up to Boston University, continuing to hide in school. There was a big financial downturn back in like 08. And that was sort of when I was coming out of. Um, or actually those when I enrolled in Manhattan School of Music. So I'd always made fun of people who stayed in school forever, but then I became that guy. <laughs> and so uh, I finished in Boston in 2011 after two years there. So from graduating high school in 1999, friends, um, until uh, 2011, I was like a college student. <laughs> and um, I racked up a lot of debt, but I did build a Rolodex. And that's basically the biggest thing I've got to offer you today We'll get back to that in a second. But my point is, yeah, Clay Hill is doing quite well for himself now, but this is all still kind of recent in the grand scheme of my life. Yeah. This is the last six years, and actually only the last two years did anyone know my name. Because I, I was making plenty of money before that, but that's because I was covering. I was a cover, and I was understudying big parts in big houses in the States. Like I covered at the Met, I covered San Francisco, I covered Chicago, but none of the, none of the Lead, lead music directors or the lead stage directors, everybody who I was, because again, I'm just, I'm just the guy sitting in the corner, you know, absorbing everything I can and, you know, being there in case a uh, backup was needed. And I, actually, a backup was never needed. I never actually was elevated. One time, one time I'm a list maker, one time I sat down and wrote all the things that I had covered from my young artist world all the way up to like that time, which was maybe 2019, I made this list. And I was like, there have been over 225 nights of my life that I went to a theater with the potential to be called upon to go on. <laughs> Zero times did it happen. Mm -hmm. just, that was just, that's just how it worked out in my case. Now, there were some times when I wasn't covering, but I, but someone somewhere in some other part of the country or the world needed somebody really quickly, and I went and did a jump up. That's technically separate from covering. But uh, anyway, I spent a lot of time doing that. That gets us back to about 2016. So there was this time of 2011 to 2016 where it was just kind of touch and go. It was like, I stayed with my folks. I tried to keep my expenses down as much as I could. I think my folks were pretty generous. They didn't even, ever even charge me rent. I have an entrepreneurial brother who does like hard labor out in the sun as a landscape uh, designer. And I would just kind of minimum wage, just go out in the Georgia heat with like, what I say, thousands of degrees and tons of school and here I am in my thirties living with my folks working with my little brother like to make minimum wage on the hot sun in Georgia. So it's just it's not I'm sorry to give you all this, you know, real talk. I but I think you need to hear I think it, it goes really hand of hand. It goes really hand about it. She was like, just smarter about it, more skilled about it. I was like, you know, she she does really cool things that she loves. I ended up mowing grass for my brother. You know? But like, you know, when you think about like all the audition trips where like you stayed on someone's floor, yeah. like how much more comfortable or like a better use of that kind of money would it have been if you would have had another, if you had a kind of cushion yeah. and you were like, you know what, sure. I can afford to stay in a hotel, I can afford to get a good night's sleep the night before my audition. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Clay is really, really lucky, one, because He's incredibly talented, but especially because he's an incredibly talented Heldon tenor. So he's one of ten in the world who is singing right now at the level that he's singing. And it's such a niche that um, it's just a very different trajectory than, say, a lyric soprano of, you know, who you just like throw a rock outside and you're like, hey, can you sing me? And you're like, yeah, you know. Um, but but the um, but the hardship went through a lot of hardship as 
that's no, yeah, it's that, like yeah, a yeah, lot of yeah, 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 continue to follow yeah. up on it. And I know well, it's not the most organized train of thought here, but even given the fact that I do see something that's highly specialized, I had people, like, in, like I said back in so my Boston era, I don't know why I have this kind of elephant memory. <laughs> I just remember being, just kind of looking around, being like seeing the people who were winning the competitions and the people who were getting like immediately like plucked up into the system comfortably, from my perspective. Because the grass is always greener, right? And I was just, you know, just, you know, kind of confiding to people, like coaches and things. I'm like, is there something I could be doing better? Is there something? What, what can I be doing? And it was just, it was just, I was just going to pat on the back. I'm 28 years old. So this is back in 2011 or so. And people were just patting on the back. Oh, Clay, you're any moment now. Like, you're going to explode at any moment. So I was 28 years old. So I'm supposed to be exploding at 28, or at most 28 and a half or 29 years old, according to, like, People that weren't blowing smoke, they were just like, you know, most people heard me sing even then and were like, why isn't this guy like getting sucked up in the system more quickly? And I think about 10 years later now, we have the answer, and that is, I just sing a repertoire. I'm not 41, but I'm a baby for what I do. I'm the youngest, I think I might be one of the youngest that ever, I, I have a Deutsche Oper Berlin debut in Siegfried at age 39, and even that, was because a tenor couldn't, Simon O'Neill, my friend, couldn't get out of New Zealand during lockdown. And I was able to leave the States and go there. So even that was like a happy, a wonderfully happy accident. But that's 10 years later. It's, it's 10, years later. 10 years later. It was 10 years later, after, after the people were just like, oh Clay, don't worry, why are you, yeah. you of all people, Clay, why are you worried about your career? And I'm like, exactly, like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not worried that there will be, that I won't get there one day, but like, what is that one day? Like, you know, that's that answer, right? Yeah. And how can you afford to live while you're waiting for that? I can't just, I, I, try, I kept trying to call, like, you know, the Visa people and the, um, and the Verizon people and be like, no, you don't understand. I've got amazing potential <laughs> in the field of opera. So I'm just like, not going to pay my bills until I get there. That doesn't work, and I'm going to take that. Yeah. So it is, and also, I didn't have to be as an entrepreneurial because I was still able to make just enough to continue to kind of piddle along. Yeah. And all during that time, sorry, this is getting back to something. But I had to that a minute ago, so I just, my brain is weird. The best thing I can tell you right now is to build yourself like a giant email list of everyone, of every professional contact you know. Don't do your, don't do your peer level colleagues though. They don't want to hear about your successes. No, <laughs> do not put them on your email list. Every, and every year, send an annual update of stuff you've been like, even if you haven't like, performed, stuff you've been working on, stuff you've been coaching, videos, updated videos, updated audio, and just that list just gets longer every year. The more people you meet, even right now, think back to as recently as like high school or something, or as far back as high school, maybe kids. Um, your chorus teacher, the, the drama teacher at your high school, um, your parents' wealthy friends. <laughs> um, give them an annual update. Make yourself just sound, just puff yourself up. Make yourself just sound like the greatest up and coming thing the world is ever going to see. New recordings all the time and take down your old recordings after you in your own mind have decided that that's not a good representation of what you are today. And then find a pianist, find a cameraman, find a room and make, make yourself, you know, update, updated stuff. But just every, I'll, I'll read it in a minute, I'll, where's my phone? I'll, I'll dig it up in a second. And I'll read you an example of one of the ones I used to send off. And I'll send it to you, yeah. I don't care. Um, and I did that for years. And there, were, there was work that came from that. Because it just gets your name. I mean, your name is your brand. I hate, I hate that I don't know your names already. I will, I will like, when, we, when we work <laughs> together. Yeah. We'll see you, we're gonna hang out. Um, we're gonna go with y'all to, to Chico Teddy um, on, on Sunday. We're gonna have, ask us anything at any time. Um, but your name is your brand. That is your brand. You're the Nike and you are the Adidas and you're the, that your name, the more your name is pops up in people's mind, the greater chances are that that's gonna be, that gets you to the next level professionally. So, the more you just remind people that you do exist, because just as you meet zillions of people every year, so are the people that know you and could hire you and they're meeting zillions of people, but if you keep getting your name into their, into their ear, into their mind, and that list will grow every single year. And like I said, I got work as a result of that. And even though it wasn't like gigantic work, it just it just meant that I didn't have to cut grass with my brother quite as much, you know, just to continue to live. Yeah. And so, so I was not again. 
even when I was not making it big, even when I was not even covering it in the big houses, yes, I was able to still do things like Faust and Pinkerton and Don Jose at, you know, C level or E or D level houses. Um, and it was enough. Like, I, I'm thankful for that. I never actually had to really be that creative, thank God. But also, it wasn't like I, I was, the first, I still went into great debt, and I still, you know, was able to, you know, wasn't able to save anything, but at least I wasn't like completely destitute. I did, I was able to make enough, but it wasn't anything, you know, it was just, it was awesome to build, to build the, to build the email list. So, anyway, talk, and I'll, I'll bring up, I'll bring up my example, I'll okay. bring it to you. Yeah, um, another thing with like the email list on a social media standpoint, and I actually need to be better about taking my own advice, but Facebook is dead. However, Facebook is where the people who are hiring tend to be. So, and this is slightly changing as, as the administrative um, like changing of the guard gets younger and starts to become millennial. So Instagram is becoming a better place, but Facebook is still where like a lot of people who hire hang out. They're not really on Instagram. And with the way the Instagram algorithm works, they might not be seeing you on Instagram. Um, they might not be following you, but Facebook like still matters. Um, and like that's where a lot of visibility for like those people who are hiring, like, just don't forget about Facebook. And I say that, like, reminding myself, Sarah, don't forget about Facebook. Because, you know, you really don't want to, but, like, I would think Facebook is the LinkedIn of the opera world. Like, just if you're doing something cool and you want, like, that administrative group to just see you and be reminded that you exist, like, just remind yourself to do, like, a little update on Facebook about what you're doing, where you are, what you're seeing because that is like where that email list kind of person does hang out. Um, so that's important. And yeah, I think the, the email list is really, really important. Um, we kind of like have this idea of like, oh, nobody's thinking of me and that is because they don't like me, but it's just because no one's thinking of anyone until they see them. So it's so like, true. yeah, and also remembering that it might take a couple times for your content to show up. So don't feel annoying if you're posting about the same thing a couple times, um, because it might take a couple posts for your target audience to see what you're doing. And it's like that battle. I feel like your generation is very good about posting in a way that like isn't like cringe. I feel like my generation is really terrible at it. Like we all know, like stay away from like, you know, the like can I stay at school or like, you know, like a picture of the score being like, I'm doing a thing. Like obviously you guys won't do that. Like, you know, find like an authentic way to to talk about like what is exciting to you and like what you're learning and uh, why this experience is like unique and cool and you know like real stuff that will make people be like oh wow how fascinating and it's great to see that they're doing stuff so apparently and serendipitously it turns out and i'm a pack rat <laughs> even electronically so back i discovered that i even have the very first one i did 2011 in a folder called annual update so it went something like this, dear friends and colleagues, on the advice of several mentors, I'm starting a yearly email update describing my recent, current, and future operatic exploits, many of them possibly involving many of you. For some, it will have been a good while since we communicated. For others, it will have only been a few weeks or months. Anyway, and then I just, I have a paragraph here where I've said like what, what I've done recently, and then uh, the recent school stuff, recent roles that I added at while I was at Boston, and then referencing some of the past summer apprenticeship work that I did in the next paragraph. Um, and then so toward the end of it, in the spring of 2010, I launched my professional website, www.playlady.com, where you may find many recordings, pictures, and videos. Also, there's more detailed information on past and upcoming performances, as well as a complete press kit. Also, my YouTube page, if you're here. Uh, life is wonderful, operatic life is a joy. I hope the same may be said of yours. All the best to you in the coming weeks and months, Playlady. So I'll, I'll forward that to you guys at the end of the I mean, it just has a template. And then it, it, it grew over the years. It got like a little less wordy and it just sort of it became more of a bullet point deal. But it get, the point is, it got your brand name like in the mind of people who could possibly, you know, bring your career along. And 
coaches, the pianists, anyone you've ever worked with, just put them on there. And if, if so many times, like it didn't lead to anything, but it just it makes your previous the, the people who've invested in your career. It makes them proud of you to, to see you just like still at it. So like you know, tenaciously you know, uh, uh, plug in yourself and and, um, and making the best of, of, of what you can do. If I might add, yeah. uh, before this, sorry, Carlos. Um, one thing that's really helped me a lot, just to jump in, is I'm terrible at copies kind of things, and I'm also terrible at being millennial making posts. <laughs> and everything from probably February on this year, I've just used chat to see. Have you? Yeah, I mean, don't use it for your papers in an academic setting, but yeah, you write in chat GPT feel like you're a little awkward about something, write a professional post on Facebook using hashtags about this and write out what you want to write and it takes what you know you want said and puts it in a professional Facebook post and I've done it for Twitter, I've done it for emails. So uh, I just want to throw that out there that that thing is like that and then it's, there's a free version. And then you can tweak it to make yeah. it sound more like yourself. Exactly. Style. There's the one on Snapchat that works on Snapchat too. Just say rewrite in a professional way. You can be completely like, I do it a lot for emails when I'm like not in a clear head space. That's and it right. just professionally does it. And I go, so, yeah. I write it. so I'm just throwing that out there for you all that you can use AI now, which is so much easier and it takes away a lot of the awkwardness and time that it takes to write these kinds of things. So please do share yeah. this because it's fascinating. Because yeah, it's hard to write about yourself. That's, it's, that's the tricky, that's the tricky thing. And I noticed like with my, with my business, it was so much easier for me to sell jewelry than to like sell myself because it, it it felt like this disconnect. Like it wasn't like like I wasn't putting myself out there. I was like buy it or don't buy it, you know. And I was talking to a friend. And they were like, that's exactly the kind of like attitude you should have about your sin. And I was like, I guess, but it's so personal. So sometimes like writing a you know writing something, writing a bio or writing an email can feel really difficult because it's you know you're selling yourself. And that's like the hardest thing. Carlos, did I interrupt you? you oh, I was going to ask the email, do you CC or BCC or do you let everybody see the oh. oh, another, th another lesson learned the hard way. At some point or another, yeah, that, that list, I just was like, oh, just copy paste the whole thing. And then everyone had everyone to the email address. They're like, BCC. I would appreciate it if you could figure out how to BCC this. So, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Excellent point. That's great. Yeah. Just figure out a way to not let your whole list be seen by everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. So smart. But if your friends do it, then you just write down those emails really fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just put those emails somewhere safe. <laughs> yeah. So I kept it going for I kept it going for six, seven years. And people were always really happy to hear from me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess I promised like real numbers and I didn't give real numbers. So so just like kind of ballpark of like what singers can make. I've talked to a lot of colleagues. I've talked to people like in Germany and stuff. I talked to someone who had like what looked like a very full fest, and they said when all was said and done, they had like a net income of like 15,000 euros. Maybe that was like, maybe their gross is like 35. Um, but like if you think about that, like it's that's just like a, like a, example of how seeing that someone is constantly busy and constantly working does not necessarily mean that they are taking a lot of money home and living comfortably. It also doesn't mean that they're not successful. So I think in opera we kind of have to like throw out the idea of like success and money go together. Yes. But there's an asterisk. Yes. Because rent and groceries are much less expensive in, in Germany. Germany. And your so health insurance. 15, 000, yeah, and health insurance yes. is covered. So 15,000 euros goes way goes further way yes, than $15,000 really would go to the States. Right. That would be gone tomorrow. Right, especially because if, if the Fest is paying that amount, it's taking into account the cost of living in the town. So this was, this was a smaller town, which was more affordable, and it, it was totally livable. I guess, um, and this singer also had a spouse who was making a good living. It worked out, but like just thinking about the fact that someone could be very successful and not be making that much. So now, like Clay's career, like working exclusively Wagner in the A houses. I mean, do you want to speak to that? Like, well, no, I think this is a great, yeah. this is a great segue moment yeah. to talk about how do we get you guys thinking about 
as we said, we had dinner last night with Mitchell, and he was like, look, it's just a numbers game. I need you to, you know, really, really give some real talk to these guys about how the States is just, the numbers just aren't there, the performances aren't yeah. there, the venues aren't there, by comparison to what we have in Germany, mm -hmm. Austria, and Switzerland. So, specific numbers, <laughs> or as close as I get to being specific, from what I did some research on a few uh, months, years ago, I don't remember. But uh, in a given year in North America, there might be 2,500 performances total of all operating. That's from like, you know, the basement level of just like your, you know, East Peoria, you know, Coral Society, all the way up to the Met. It's about 2,500. Just in the country of Germany alone, there are like 7,500. That's not to mention tons in Austria and good number in Switzerland. And, and I mentioned these three countries. Right? That's not taking into account, like, like oh, that's or, just opera. Yeah, that's not opera. oratorio. That's not concert work. That's just opera. Of course, actually, opera base has now begun to kind of. That's what I say opera. That's my source for something. That uh, actually, they have begun the, the symphonic stuff. That's kind of recent. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's just your bare minimum. Your seventy-five hundred performances. So they need singers. Yeah. They need, and, but I'm not, again, I'm not saying you're going to get plucked up. So, okay, back to my story. So, 2015, I went over for the first time. In late 14, I went to sing for a society in New York, a foundation that is specifically designed for to help the, um, the the potential dramatic voice from like school and young artist years into into full time career. It's called the Old Dumb Farai Foundation, and I can give you that link. Um, if you're a dramaticish type, or you think you might be at some point, and they, yeah, so you, if you sing for them, actually, you used to sing, I think, for uh, Martina Arroyo, and then if she, she would pass you along to this other committee that would then determine you know, how much money you'd get or whatever. So you sing for them. If they find you have potential, then you would scribble out like a, a grant proposal, like say you need to buy some Nico Castell volumes to translate your arias, or I mean, translate your role, or if you need to, if you need. Uh, you know, five hundred dollars worth of coachings. You know, I, I need seven coachings on this role. And if you itemize it, and then they would send you a check, and then of course you're accountable to provide receipts afterward to make sure there's no you know misuse of funds. And, but the first time I applied to them was late fourteen, and I was given a grant, and I used that grant to go to on my first ocean trip to Germany in two thousand early in January twenty fifteen, and I had an agent in the states at the time who helped line up some stuff. Turns out January is not the greatest time to go at all. Um, learned that the hard way, and not to mention the weather is just shit <laughs> in, in Germany. The W. Um, learning experience, all of it. Made some connections. Actually, did land myself like one concert gig to to return later in the summer of '15. Did that. Added him to my email list. <laughs> the conductor that hired me for that. Um, went back in 20. 15, no, excuse me, excuse me, fall of 2015. I went over there three different times in one year. Um, uh, I wouldn't have been able to go for the final trip had I not uh, luckily won the New York Wagner Society uh, first place competition for their, for their vocal competition that year. So I put every penny of that into, into that trip. So it's not like I went to ball anything. It was pretty, actually my car was kind of struggling at the time and I won it. Actually I was with my parents again because where I lived. And I, I, they didn't announce who the winner was like publicly. They just didn't just send you in the mail. Like so I, I didn't know I won anything. So I, really? Yeah, so I reached in the mailbox. I was like, oh, first prize. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and then my dad was just like, yeah, again, not, not music. You know, not, my parents weren't musicians at all. My dad was like, oh, it's good down payment on a new car. I was like, no, dad, I've got to actually reinvest all this in some sort of Airbnb in Frankfurt, Germany, and <laughs> get on an airplane. As much as I would love to have a new car, but, you know, whatever. Not, not my priorities. Um, so I went back a third time, and all that snowballed into me getting like one debut as a guest uh, as a guest contract to sing Idomeneo in Würzburg, Germany, the same place that it hired me for the concert, which again was a result of that first trip. Now that's the good side. The bad side was I get I'm bringing something really unique. Like the world is constantly lamenting that the big voice tenors and like who's going to take up the mantle of Kelvin and all this. And I'm just singing my guts out. I'm just like, I'm giving it. I'm doing everything I can. And none of I sang for Opera Cologne. I sang for the Komische Opera in Berlin. 
And goodness, it was so long ago, it would take me a little bit to remember, but I probably could at some point if I want to put it on the spot. Um, I sang for good places, and allegedly there's this great shortage for home tennis, but even then, it's just like, sometimes you're just not the cup of tea. Also, the people that are casting are usually stage directors instead of like people who really have an intimate knowledge of voice, whatever. Another conversation uh, for maybe a little bit later. But the point is, even people who eventually, I'm at the top of the heap now, I love my life, I would trade it for a single thing, I'm knocking it dead, but again, I've been singing this way for a long time. It's just a matter of like the right person. So at any of those, in those times, how many times, the, how many times, the, when, I first, when I first met Sarah, I was literally borrow, I had to borrow $300 from a colleague just to like, just to like pay something, I don't remember what it was. And then like when I got paid like two weeks later, I paid him back immediately. And like, so you can still be doing all the right things. What you do and who you are, it's not reflected in your bank account. So just, you got to know the deep down that like you're after this. Okay. Um, but back to Germany, I think it's essential that you guys all sing for as many competitions, any kind of foundation that you can apply to and get accepted for, and talk to a rich aunt and uncle, get yourself, build up something that looks amazing and present it to every wealthy person in your life. I don't have many, many in my life. The point is just get, figure out a way to get over for an audition trip because the numbers will, are eventually going to be greatly in your favor as opposed to being in the States. And it's so, so much easier said than done. But I have another thing to say about yes. the German audition trip thing. I think you have to think about it differently. Um, like in our generation, we had a lot of teachers who had had a lot of success in the 70s and 80s. Um, before, before the wall came down. Um, and there was a different time for Germany where there wasn't like an international influx of singers. So when Americans came over, it was this thing of like, oh my gosh, American singers. American singers are really well trained and very well respected in the international scene, which is wonderful. Um, but now, you know, the world is much bigger and Germany is where everyone wants to be. And there are amazing singers from all over the world who want to come to Germany. So it's a different situation than it used to be when you could just like do an audition tour um, in like a couple weeks. There isn't really a season. Auditions happen like from like the late fall all the way to, um, all the way to like now. I think they're sort of ending for the summer. Then we'll start up again in the fall. But it's like a whole season of auditions. And the, um, the original like, you know, thing that we were all told is you go, you sing for the agents. German agents are different than American agents, so they're non-exclusive. And basically, their job is just to get you auditions. So each of these agents has a relationship with different houses. And the houses will send, like, you know, emails to the agents that they like working with saying, okay, this is what we're looking for. We need a singer who can do this, this, and this. We need this, we're looking for a guest, we're looking for a fest. And then that agent will think back who are the singers that I know that I think might be able to get this audition and get this job? Because, of course, agents only make money if they get you the job and they take the commission. So, when you go to Germany, the first step is to sing for the agents and maybe like see if you can get two or three agents who really like you. Um, you don't want to get more because then they start sending you on the same auditions and then they get like happy with each other and it turns like, but two or three that like believe in you and will send you on this. And yeah, I think that the myth of like being able to go for a week or two weeks, it has worked out for some people if just by luck the timing works out that they sing for an agent, the agent is like, oh my gosh, what luck, I just heard about a vacancy that next week within the time that you're here for something that you sing and they want to hear you but then you sing and then you're the person. But more realistically, um, that perfect vacancy isn't going to happen within your two-week audition tour. It's probably going to happen a month later, two months later, when you're not there anymore. And a lot of people who line up auditions within those audition tours are doing general auditions. So it's an informative audition um, where the house will just hear you to keep you in mind. But there is not necessarily anything for you that they're casting. They're just 
hearing you to know that you exist, and maybe three years down the line, I mean, you did some informative auditions that have turned into like huge gigs that you have now, so like they weren't a waste. Right, but they, it took years to realize years. this, and they had they had a long memory. They, they yeah, remember, they remember when they first heard me. Yeah, so like, it's definitely not a waste, but it's a long term investment. So if um, yeah, I just want to like dispel the myth that it's realistic to show up for two or three weeks and like have a bunch of like real auditions for actual vacancies lined up because it, the season just doesn't really work. Yeah? I have a question. So, it's a more personal question. Yeah. Um, do you play feel that there are certain audition and roles you didn't get because you are a local person? Oh, I think so. Yes, yeah, quite a lot. Um, thankfully, I didn't sing <laughs> baritone roles. <laughs> I think that would, that would like knock me completely out. And that I don't really, I'm not really in a voice for it anymore. Like the Jose's and the Pinkerton's and the Cavaradossi's. It's like more of the turned up. And like the sex factor is in the voice, <laughs> as opposed to like the you know, Um But yeah, I do feel like that's a thing. And that's not something I cry about. It's not anything that, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, ideally I'd love to be in a, you know, in a spelter state. And you're know, working on it, but it's like, I can't, you can't, people are going to have their biases whether they say them out loud or not, and I don't really think, yeah, I, I, I'm not, that doesn't offend me, actually. Uh, I understand people have an aesthetic that they're after, and if I'm not it, that's a, it's, it's, it's their upper house, it's their, you know, it's, I mean, is it fair or whatever, am I better than a lot of the voices that might be on there? Yeah, it could be, it could be, but, um, but I guess that's the, Long and short answers. Yeah, I think there were, there were things. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, and in the German scene, especially, as you said before, like the stage directors are running the show, so they might not know really anything about singing. And they might not really care about singing, which is yeah. really, really unfortunate for opera because singing is what we do. But um, you might get a stage director, so it's Regie Theater, like it's director theater, like the director mm -hmm. is literally running the show. And yeah, I think it's really unfortunate. Like that's not we're here to sing. Like but sometimes you get a director who like comes from film, comes from stage, and they see the character in a certain way and they would rather hire a lesser singer and have the look that they want. And I think that's stupid and I don't agree with it. But it is like a sad reality of the industry. And then there are people who are like this is the voice I want. The voice comes first. We are, a, you know, a vocal art, and they are casting for that voice. And you know. And despite yeah, and despite my being quite overweight, I am still able to move. So that's that's the time when I would get maybe a little miffed. Is it like because if you, my Zephyr is available on DVD, and I, I wasn't standing still for any of it. No, I was like, I was up and down, I was, be I was beating on me and I was killing dragons, I was doing all the things, I was moving and still singing and not out of breath, it was fine. So I just think, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I, that's when I would be offended, is when people just assume that because I'm a big guy I can't move, uh, that, that bothered me. <laughs> but, um, but, I, and I, but I think, I, I think a director is within their rights, if a singer is so big that he can't, he or she can't move, do basic staging, like get up a flight of steps and still turn around and sing. Like I can, hey, I, I kind of understand that like, that's not the best, you know, might not be the best fit for that role or that production. Um, but you know, as long as you can, as long as you can move, you know, I think I think I think it should be the main consideration and uh, sound good and move. Yeah, and especially in this like dramatic repertoire, like come on, people, like <laughs> what, <laughs> you know, like. You want you want a voice that can cut through these orchestras, mm -hmm. and that's going to come in a bigger package. That's how that voice comes, and yeah, I think I think there is like some some oversight in the in the theatrical, you know, the, in the director community, but you know. <laughs> Hey. <laughs>
curiosities. <laughs> Like be the person um, 
like if a colleague can't take a gig, they're like, oh, well, let me recommend, you know, my colleague who I know sings this repertoire, um, having on your website like a list of concert solos that you're prepared to step in for in a moment's notice and like building up that repertoire is really wise. Jump in. Like, Okay, this is this is a more unconventional question that you probably don't have an answer for, but I'm just curious because I've been trying to figure it out. So a lot of times in like certain like movies or video game soundtracks, they'll have opera singers sing in the background, and yes. like, that's what I want to do. But I don't have any idea of how they are scouting people and who they're looking for. That's a really great question. Okay, so we know I know a couple people who do that. They live in LA um, or San Francisco. Skywalker Ranch is in, outside of San Francisco, I believe, and I know that they hire a lot of like freelance singers, but like mostly singers from like the San Francisco Opera Chorus to come in and record for video games or movie soundtracks. So I know a couple of people who have done that, um, and I think it turns into just like a connection thing. Like if you've done it before, you're on the list. They probably reach out to the opera house and say, like, do you have foresters who would want to do this? But I also have a friend who did sound for a video game, and I think it was just through like a friend, like okay. kind of word of mouth. So I would say talk to people, find people, like maybe LinkedIn, like find out, like yeah. find out who they're who they're using. And just like ask for a Zoom meeting, or if you're okay. local, like, just speak to them. Like, you I, know, I would think, because I, in freshman year, I joined a game development club, because I, mm -hmm. I was interested in the art, and I did art for it. Yeah. And we, like, have, like, a finished game, and, like, there's things we did, but my main reason is because I wanted to build connections, especially because people in this club is one of, like, the biggest clubs, I think. Either, it's either the biggest one in Florida, or it's one of the biggest ones in the U.S., yeah. and they have really good connections. Like, they would bring in, like, they brought in a game developer, from one of the games who had like the opera type singing and so I was like this is a place to be so that was like kind of the first time that I was like okay this is where I'm going to build these connections or even if it's not right now yeah. like five years from now when people in that club are getting into the industry they'll remember be like like I've had them tell me like oh yeah like when we start making their games like we want you to sing mm -hmm. so this is like this one is yeah. just a connection base maybe have a separate email list for this I think I want to you were mentioning emails I'm like oh okay, yeah I think I need to start like yeah Making one for or if you wanted to record, like, I know we, we also have another, like, singer friend who um, has left, um, like, singing and is making it huge in voiceover work. Like, she's, like, like, you would, you would recognize her voice, like, major campaigns, massive career. Um, I think she started a school, like, an online school for voiceover to train other voice actors, so we'll get that info out. But, um... Okay, where was I going with this? Um, oh, yes, reels. So, like, I noticed that a lot of voiceover actors will create a reel of, like, different sample voices. Obviously, like, for this woman, like, she just uses actual campaigns she's done, but other people will, like, read an, an imaginary campaign. Like, they'll do, like, this is a voice. If I were, like, reading for, I don't know what, a, a, pharmaceutical ad, this is if I was running for a chocolate ad, and they would do like a sample. So you could put together a reel of um, like existing video game soundtracks, like just an example of what you do, and then send that out there to be like, hey, this is what I do. Like if you know of anyone, if you know of anyone who you'd like to connect to you with, it's always a good one because okay. maybe they have other people who they, um, and again, it's so much more fun and more creative and easier to do emotionally when it's something that's sort of outside of the Apple world because there aren't really rules. Yeah, like, you, yeah. And okay. the voices too, like they're just, they do things more like that I want to do with yeah. the voice force, like, ah, this yeah. is where I want to be. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so my question is, whether you were to speak during the movie and did you, did you um, learn this before the move? Or did you, are you learning more so we are learning in now. Germany? And, and do you feel that it helps you more professionally to know and speak German when you're in auditions and with other people? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, learn languages now. We're talking about 
Languages, yes. yes. Languages, yeah. So work on your languages. I would say Italian and German. French is a little bit less important, but if you have learned those other two, learn French. So, um, but yeah, German definitely, like, so in the A houses, English is the common language. Um, but uh, I know the chorus at Deutsche Oper rehearses all in German. So um, our American friends who are full-time chorus there um, are learning German pretty fast. That's like a, a plus. Like you're, you know, if you want to talk with people, not understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they're they're learning German. Um, I'm in the process of trying to get a fest somewhere in Germany, and in those auditions. I try and speak as much German as possible, um, and it's fine. I find people do speak English, but I think it's important for me to go in there and show them that I would be able to get by in German because rehearsals are going to be in German and um, smaller, smaller cities um, will be will be doing most of the things in German. But English is always there in an emergency. So yeah. yeah, so I had an, an audition um, where they wanted to like interview me afterwards, and I had done everything in German, and then they started asking me, you know, rapid fire questions, and I was like, "Would it be okay if we switch to English?" And then they all had perfect English, and it was fine. Um, but I think like just showing that effort and, and you know doing your best. Duolingo. Yes. Yeah. Just do the Duolingo, yeah. just do it. You learn a lot of vocabulary. Yeah. As long as you learn a lot of vocabulary, a lot of grammar can be forgiven. As long as you can as as yeah. speak with speak with <laughs> with good, you know yeah, with good diction. Um yeah. I think it I think it'd be fine. That's where we have the leg up on other people that are uh, the types of individuals trying to learn the language. At least our pronunciation is already like pretty good. Now as far as terminology, everyone's down like you know what a fest contract is as opposed to what a you can explain it. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you're there, fest just means it's just a translation of the word firm. Like it's, just a, it's a regular, it's a firm contract where like you work your your nine to five job is like this opera house. You're a full time employee. Full time employee with benefits and all that. And that's what Sarah was talking about earlier when she mentioned you know certain ballpark numbers you can expect to make at a small city in Germany as a regular person. So you're singing um, Barbarina. And and Frosquita and you know you're singing secondary roles. Well, that depends on the size of the house. True. If you're fast in a big house, you're probably going to be singing Frosquita and Barbarina and stuff like that. But if you're fast at like a medium-sized house, then they're probably only bringing in guests when they don't have someone with fast. True. So like what I'm looking for is a place where I can do my core repertoire for like two years and just like you know do millions of performances of five core roles. So mm -hmm. so like yeah at like a, at a at an A house the, the fest or ensemble singers are mostly singing supporting roles and like the me medium houses um, their their ensemble singers are singing everything. And the other kind of contract would be guest, which is what I do and that's just you know it's just just like it is in the States. You know, you get hired to do this gig, you fly there, you perform it and then you leave. So the guest contract easy enough. And then fest is so you get this one place all the time. And those contracts are issued on a two-year basis normally. Uh, sometimes three. Maybe. Sometimes yeah. one. But yeah. I think the standard is like you're hired for two years, and then unfortunately your job is always up to like the chopping block every two years. Um, and also they have what's called intendant vexel, which means the general director will change over to somebody else, and then that incoming director preserves the right to like clean house if he or she wants to. Yeah. So that's the only bad. That's that's what that's the not firm part of the fest. Is <laughs> There's that no total part? job security. Unless you're in the chorus. Yeah. Chorus is a full time gig that pays better than fest. <laughs> it does. And you have but job you are, security. But you are worked. I mean, they work you to death. But if, if if you're cool with that, if you're cool, if you if your artisticness is satisfied by just singing, but in a costume. Singing with staging and original languages, and just having some complete job and security and health insurance and all that, and living in Germany and just like building a life there. That is a very legit way to satisfy yeah. your artistic, you know, desires, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because if if you're thinking about Europe, that 
those auditions are really challenging. Um, I've had, we've had a couple friends go through it. We have a few really good friends who are full-time chorus um, at Deutsche Oppa Berlin. And that is a lifetime appointment. Like, you, it's an amazing job. And they get paid really well. And they are singing, like, six or seven performances a week. They are it's working hard. really, really hard. But you have a paid um, vacation every August? Six weeks. You get six weeks off mm -hmm. every year. And, it, and insurance, and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to make a life there. Um, from what we hear, the auditions are really, really challenging. Um, actually, I think the, the existing chorus is there for your audition, and it's like this like Hunger Games kind mm -hmm. of situation. It's very, it's very um, competitive, and as a result, they're like really top-level singers. There's, there's two houses in the United States that have ever had full-time chorus. The Met in Chicago. Mm -hmm. As far as full-time pay, we've been there. Yeah. But in Europe, But in Europe, every the... single, even even the lower level, even low-budget places, all the chorus are just mm -hmm. full-time employees. Yeah. They earn a living wage for the city they're in. Yes. So that is, like, definitely... Those are three types of contract. Yeah. Chorus, fast, yes. Yeah. Yeah, terminology. Mm -hmm. Do you know how long the chorus contracts are ordered on average? Forever. Like, For the chorus? Are you allowed to leave whenever you want? I mean, you'd be giving up your position. Yeah. But you could. But I mean, like, you know, have, like, they won't keep you. They also have all these yeah. laws that, like, you could be you could be on maternity leave. Yes. For, like, a year. Yes, that's and a great And then come back and get a position. Like, they, like, action. reserve it for you. They'll have a substitute in your position for, like, a year. Yeah. And then you can come back. Something that you were told by instructors, or it was always apparent in everyone in the room right away? Excellent question. So, I never called myself a Helden tenor. I thought that was obnoxious. <laughs> Self described Helden tenor. Okay. Um, you probably have one in your life. Um, it's a thing. I reserved that. I, 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 Withheld that title for myself until another held tenor put that title on me. My current mentor, John Frederick West, I still go spend a week with him every year in his retirement uh, his retirement city of Utica, New York. Uh, we work at least a week every year on this upcoming repertoire. I actually stay with him. I stay with him and his wife. Um, we work on stuff. You know, work, work through one to two roles. You know, in the course of that one week. And so I began working with him in 2015, and he really revolutionized uh, re revolutionized my sound. Um, and also, this is something I meant to say earlier, I'm glad I'm remembering it now, but once you get an idea of who you are in the terms of like, fuck and division, find somebody from that fuck to get with, even if it requires travel. Do you think that you're, you know, if you think you're a Spinto Soprano, find yourself a working Spinto Soprano now who you can go coach with a couple times, get some opinions, etc. That was the last like level of like polishing that I needed. But I always had, also, if I might say so, a very easy upper register and an ability to sing very quietly. In addition to my, you know, whatever, held in like punch and I which I'm obviously grateful to have, I can sing quite delicately. And I think everyone must be able to, but that part of my voice threw a lot of people off. They heard how easily that I could sing quietly and sensitively or whatever, and high at the same time, and that caused a question mark for a lot of people. The fact that I could do this other like, little thing and no one had actually properly taught me how to do the other thing, like the, like the, the thrusty, you know, full-on sort of darkish, baritonalish business, like in the bottom, and even like maintain. We'll talk about this obviously more on Monday, but like the ability of keeping sinking down as you go into the top. It was almost like my top was too easy because no one knew how to teach me to go into the top with the proper amount of body. So when I went up there, it was almost not held enough. So 
I was controversial for a long time. We used to have that word. Yeah. That was I, that could also be another reason why the career didn't take off in those years that I wanted it to, was because maybe my audition list of arias was a little confusing. Maybe I, I, th I mean, think ultimately the answer, the easy way to say it is, I'm a helm tenor that was not able to access his full resonance until he was 34, 35, something like that. And it was like that, it was just like a little bit of tweaking. And it's not like I had abandoned a whole bunch of stuff. I, it was just I added this other element that we'll talk about. Because I was with somebody who had done it before. Yeah. And who just, 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 I mean, the world is also full of, um, of careful teachers who don't know dramatic singing. And so that's why I'm saying, because you asked the question, because, because it's, you know, a, a, an issue, I would say if you think yourself a borderline young, young, you can list your held in soprano if you think that's what you are. Spinto plus, you know, find yourself somebody. I'll brainstorm if, if, that's, if that's what you think. Go ahead, I can, I can provide you some contacts. And yeah, just get with somebody, just get with somebody who you think is what you might be. Yeah. Like three more questions. She remembered. Um, so I know in the musical theater world they have switches mm -hmm. and you learn multiple roles. Do they also have that in the opera world? No, they should. They definitely should. It would solve a lot of problems, but they don't. Just covers. Um, and in Germany, often not covers. Yeah. So, yeah. Germany so. is so small. And there's so many singers there, they don't actually hire you, hire covers. Yeah. They'll just fly, they'll just get somebody on a train, you know, call somebody at 10 a.m., put them on a train, bring them up, and yeah. teach them the, the part, and they go the on the same thing night. On, the, on the train and on the DVD, yeah. and then you just jump in. But um, it would solve a lot of problems if that was, if Swing was really more like a thing in that practice. But I think it would only work for a couple operas and a couple voice types. That's probably why like, there just isn't the same amount of, you know, versatility. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so living in the same world or doing kind of the same stuff with opera and concert, how do you successfully get a, a relationship to work? That's a great question. Um, so we we started off long distance, and we're very good at that. Luckily, we get to be together quite a bit, but like, you know, it's not uncommon for us to have three weeks apart, a month apart. Um, we're very good at it. Um, and I think because we're both in the industry, it, it's, not a, it's not as big of an ask as it might be if one of the partners is not in the industry and like just doesn't understand just how bonkers this life is. Like, you know, I was working when my sister got married and couldn't come to the wedding. And like, that's a thing. Like, that's a thing that happens all the time. So, you know, it wasn't something that phased me. You know, I was like, well, yeah, he's working. And like, this is, you know, this is how it goes. Um, but yeah, I think communicating um, when you're on the road. Um, like, we like to watch Netflix together if we're apart. Like, we'll be like, okay, what are we watching? Like, and press play. And then we'll like, you know, just like, just finding ways to like, to still like, be connected and, and make time for each other when you're apart. But, um, but it is, it is difficult. Um, I was previously married to someone who's not in the industry, and that was, it was a really hard sell to explain what I do, and you know, just the fact that like, well, I might be gone for a couple months at a time, like that was not something that my ex was okay with. So, I think it's tough, I think it's, you know, it, it's really nice for us to be in like a two-singer relationship because even though we might actually not get to spend as much time, well no, I think we get to spend more time together because we can just go, yeah, if we're not both on a gig, we can just go with the other person. It is, yeah. Yeah, 
I guess it, and it doesn't necessarily it doesn't have to be a singer. It's just that that, that ends up being that that partner. Um, just anybody who doesn't, for whatever reason, require that. And then, no, no judgment anywhere. I mean, that, that's that thing's more abnormal to be like us and just be able to be a part. Sometimes we're apart. We don't even talk. Every day. I mean, we text. We text all the time. We we'll go a week without even hearing each other's voice and stuff. But I don't know how she sounds in text. You know, it's fine. But I'm okay with that. And she's okay yeah. with that. And it's not because it's not only because we're singers. We're just kind of the, the wired yeah, that way. Yeah, we're independent. We're very independent. Yeah. I think we're independent. Yeah. However, we also lived in a camper for the entirety of COVID and didn't kill each other. So yeah. But we're cool. We're cool together. We're cool apart. It's yeah, I think one more party gives us time to miss each other. It's yeah, nice. which is great. I mean, that's really important. Also, I know a lot of people are working remotely now. So, um, one of my good friends, her husband, just brings his work with, you know, and you're in a situation like that too. Or like, so I think it's becoming a lot easier because so many companies are offering remote work. But then, you know. Honestly, sometimes for me, like I was just working in London, and I could have been there the whole time. But at a certain point, I was like, I have things to do in Berlin. Like I gotta get back and like do my things and live my life. So I'm gonna come back to Berlin, and I'll see you in a week. And um, so it is wonderful to be able to travel with your partner, but then also to realize that you both have goals and lives and places to be and things to do and like be okay with that as well. Right, yeah. Yes. I like to personally know what are your individual ranges? Oh. Okay, so the highest note that I feel comfortable singing on stage is a high D, maybe a certain E flat in a certain situation, but D. Um, and then on the low end, gosh, I'm singing something, I have a good chest voice, I'm, I'm just singing, thinking of like what's applicable. I'm singing something now, a new piece that has like a low G below the staff. I wouldn't say it's a great note for me, but I'm singing it, so, it's, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it just sounds like a little. But you got Alma Mahler kind of note, but that's not, it's just sits low. It just sits it low, it's a low kind of note, but it doesn't, and it's not super, it's not super low. I always had a high city voice, so I was never that the pushed up baritone sound, sounding help to it. That's a, there's two types of helm tenor. The kind that I just described coming from the bottom, like baritones who decided in their 40s that they could, that's called the Schweres. S C H W E R E S, meaning heavy, heavy helm tenor, heavy dramatic. I was called Echtes, E C H T E S, true. Like, I, no denying, no one hears me and says, I mean, will you have a baritone? I never get that question. Um, so I got the high notes. Uh, I sing, I guess that for a heroic tenor, really all you need is a B flat. That's usually like your money note, especially in Italian rap. Um, of course, Victor Demerung has a very exposed high C and actually a kind of brief one in the back two. Then back three, it's completely a cappella. Um, I'm thankful that I do have, that I come from the high side because I've got that. Um, but I'll always, I'll always um, warm up to a B flat. Anytime we get, uh, I warm up a half pitch to a whole whole pitch higher than I actually need on stage. I don't want the thing I'm going out to say on stage to be the highest thing I've sung that day. So in the dressing room, even in even in like even you got the demo room, I'll sing. I'll squeak. It's not pretty. It's not ready for prime time. But I'll squeak out a high D. My teacher says it's important to be able to like just hit like hit an E flat. Not, again, not ready for prime time, but just to like. Thin out, learn how to thin out your voice enough to like get all the way up there. Now on the bottom end, Siegmund is, sits very low for me. And lots of times that's a pushed up baritone part, and he's got a lot of low C's, and those those barely come out. But thankfully the roll sits low, so it's not like I'm screaming a bunch of high notes and then have to get back down. My voice also goes up over the course of the night as opposed to like I think like my teacher, who's also Echtis, but true Helen tenor. Uh, never a baritone. Um, he said it was the opposite. His voice went down in the course of the night. So I'm, wow. I'm grateful that mine works uh, that way, where it goes 
so. Uh, so from C to shining high C. <laughs> I had, to, I had to do a very brief B natural and on, the, on the low end for frow and shot, but it happened so quick. Yeah. Well, chicken, I don't know I mean, just, it's like a, a low, light orchestration in that moment, so that's good. Yeah, there's a low B flat, but there's a, there's a piece that I want to do so bad. It's, it's actually at the very top of my uh, a concert rap list that I have not yet done that I want to do. And it's Schoenberg's Führer uh, Lieder. It's this big choral piece. It's before he went nuts with 12 tone. Schoenberg <laughs> actually wrote a beautiful <laughs> song. Amazing. Yeah. You wouldn't believe it. You would, just, you would assume it was uh, you would assume it was Brahms, or you would assume it was uh, it could be corn gold. I mean it's just it's lush and wonderful before music had to become math. And um, but Gura Leader is beautiful, it's got this great hero uh, tenor part, and it has like an explode exposed low B flat. So working on trying to get down there. That was the last one. I have the last question, of course. please. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember now. So, uh, how age affects your scene? Like uh, when you're 20s, 30s, now you're 40s. So, uh, uh, which part you think you are improving? And the age, how the age uh, gives you a different feeling when you see? <laughs> it's the exact same question. And talking about the low oh. stuff, the, 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 the low stuff. My lower range, I have way more now than I ever had at any point previously in my life. But that's kind of a natural progression, I think. Uh, you know, for for the man, uh, as puberty hits and you, your voice drops, you know, an octave, and then essentially you have kind of a new voice. So you're kind of relearning everything um, from that moment on. And yeah, I didn't have much of a low chest voice in undergrad whatsoever. Um, but everyone always said, well, just get older and it will come in. <laughs> um, but the uh, age, I think, like I said, my teacher taught me how to be a proper, true husband tenor at age 34. And I think had I just met him four years earlier, I could have done that. Maybe in my late, maybe 29 or 30, I could have also replicated the same sound then that I have now. In my opinion, at one, there's no way to test that. All I know is at 34, I can make the same sounds that I make now. Um, there's one role that my teacher told me to to hold off on for as long as I can, and that was Tristan, because it's such a long night. He doesn't sing as much as Siegfried. Siegfried is very difficult and it's very high. He sings more than Tristan, but Tristan is just a, it's more a, a, a relentlessly heavy orchestration and you're singing against, you know, he's older a lot, and he said it's best if you can wait till 45 or 46. Well, I just did it 41. <laughs> and I have some coming up. But, I, but Sarah will tell you, I, I, I want to space those out. I don't want to take, I'm glad I don't have any this year or next year. So I have a lot of them starting at 25. It's emotionally exhausting. It's also emotionally exhausting because he's this sort of dark, brooding character, you know, yearning for death, you know, constantly. And, but, um, you know, that was the only thing, even at age 34, um, he said, the only thing I would say hold off on is is, is twist on. Yeah. So I held off on it for seven years, six, seven years, and did it, and it turned out fine. I had a big age transition. Yeah. That, um, I started my career singing Subrat Coloratura, like, I was singing Sarbinetta, I was singing Longin. Um, Suzanne does and stuff like that, but like really like high stratosphere stuff. And then around 28, my voice, it was like going through puberty again. Like my voice entirely changed. The middle came in, I mean it was wild and like pretty terrifying. Um, so now I'm like a lyric that you can so like Butterfly and Donna Anna and Netta and stuff like that. Um, and that was like a really long transition period. It was really terrifying. And the more women in their 30s I speak to, um, it's kind of a common thing that um, our, yeah, like late 20s, 30s, there is often a shift with female voices, um, a more of a fullness and um, lower notes come in. I think that there are some true coloratoras, I, I know a handful of them who are singing coloratura well into their 40s, but I think often a lot of the singers, a lot of the sopranos who are labeled as coloratoras in their teens and 20s, 
um, those high notes are just a freebie thing, um, not necessarily, um, yeah, not necessarily the true voice. So because I was able to sing a high F um, in my teens and twenties, I was pushed into that coloratura um, off and everything sort of became this manipulation to keep the voice light and forward so that I could continue to do that. And then once I aged out of it, it was finding my true voice, um, you know, without having to calibrate to create that freaky party trick kind of situation. So voice changes definitely happen, um, but I think age is always great for the voice. Like age, uh, it, it, yeah, yeah. It's, age is always great. Well, we have masterclass on Monday. Maybe we'll get to hang out before then. But uh, Clay Hilly, Sarah Duchovny, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Uh, just so everyone knows, this classroom.